So I have one, I guess I can start with one question. So have you used free surfer in the past? Um, yes, I have, but to be honest, not, not um, very intensively, mostly um, because I've been working at UCL and SPM yeah. is a product. So that was sort of um, how I started doing neuroimaging research. Um, and uh, FreeSurf is a bit of a newer product than SPM um, and definitely um, and in many ways an improvement um, or what you can do using voxel-based methods. Um, right, so um, I'm clearly not um, a huge expert on FreeSurf. Um, and I've been using CAT12 a lot. That's what I've been yeah. showing in the video, mm -hmm. which is a toolbox for SPM. Um, and I do like it because uh, um, it has an excellent manual. And so for uh, beginners or, or sort of uh, users with not a lot of experience, it's, it's a good starting point um, because this interface of SPM can be very yeah. intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> SPM overall, it's quite easy, to be honest. Uh, it's just clicking buttons. It doesn't need a yeah. lot of expertise, um, but it has a very steep learning curve at the beginning. Uh, the reason is there are a lot of buttons and a lot of weird mm -hmm. names and um, uh, things that you can adjust. But in the end, it's it's all relatively straightforward. Um, whereas FreeSurfer, because it's command-based, um, it uh, is a bit daunting at the beginning because you need some sort of, at least some sort of a programming skills or something like that. So it doesn't really have a visual interface. Um, but it may even be easier to use than SPM uh, because you don't have the, this huge amount of buttons. And for many things, there are only you know a couple of commands that you can use and it runs uh, sort of full analysis automatically. Um, one of the big deal breakers, in my opinion, is, is processing speed. So if you want, mm -hmm. if, yeah, you have, that's true. if you happen to have a large data set, um, then uh, processing pre surfer data takes quite a long time uh, unless you have access to a computer cluster or something similar. Um, and that is much faster with things like CAT12. Um, and the quality of the output is, I would say, comparable. And there are a couple of studies that show that the mm -hmm. um, reliability and uh, reproducibility of the data um, uh, pre processed with pre surfer and with CAT12 is quite similar. Clearly, they shouldn't mix the methods um, mm -hmm. because um, the results that you receive are different and they use different methods to estimate them. Um, but if you use just one method, I think they're quite comparable. Another big difference is that um, in uh, FreeSurfer, there is the option to quite heavily manually refine the data. And that is actually recommended or may even be necessary to really good, to get a good output. Um, Whereas, and that takes a huge amount of time if you want to do it properly, right? Um, yeah. Whereas yeah. in CAT12, you don't really have the option. Uh, you can do some quality controlling. And um, um, well, there's an upside and downside to that. If you have data that really don't meet the quality criteria, you, you need to chuck them out completely. Um, but you, it's overall a faster procedure because you don't do these manual adjustments and because the processing is a bit quicker. Yeah, no, I agree. I've, I've never used CAT12 before, so I've, I've only used FreeSurfer. But one of the things like that I find is just the fact that you cannot correct in CAT12. It's a little bit like, how do you... So my question is basically, once you get the output of CAT12, I know you get like this PDF, this really cool PDF with the brain, your output, some statistics, some values. Can you obtain the image itself? Can you obtain the reconstruction itself? Kind of the 3D volume or you just get that PDF volume, like a PDF file. Of course, you know, yeah, you, you get the reconstruction of the central surface um, and um, you can check for any topological errors, but it's not okay. as streamlined as in, as in FreeSurfer. And there is not really any sort of recommended way how you can sort of refine or rerun, rerun it. You just run it and and that's what you get. So you, you don't really refine it in a secondary step. Um, and that's a downside, but an upside at the same time, yeah. because uh, your processing will be uh, quicker and easier. Um, but obviously, um, I mean, if you invest a lot of time into uh, manually refining your free surfer segment, uh, free surfer 
um, uh, pre-processing, then it will get very clean and um, excellent data quality. So that's why that's the gold standard, clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I think one of the biggest uh, problems uh, is that uh, do you think BVM will be like could be used in clinical care? I think I think there are many things that we first have to uh, like try to correct this because we we still are discussing about the smoothing processing how much should you smooth or not uh, and then uh, about the normalization because for example it's 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 not possible it's actually not recommended to compare single patients even to a standardized database so it's actually very difficult to to uh, of course using using it in research might be helpful but although yeah there are caveats even in research uh, because uh, all the papers and all the studies are not even like you cannot compare them because all of them use different methodologies within bvm uh, even if they use uh, F fpm and then it's, uh, I think it's all, so, yeah, it's all it's something that it's very difficult to translate to the clinic. Right. So let me unpack that. Th those are a couple of really good questions. Um, so first of all, the role of VBM overall um, in research, I would say. Um, I, I guess VBM is an interesting method. Um, but um, in my experience, if you're looking at the morphology of the cortex, uh, looking at um, some sort of a structural or sort of three-d reconstruction of the cortex and looking at things like cortical thickness or surface area will give you uh, more interesting results. And my experience also is that the statistical power is, is higher using surface-based methods. So whenever I'm looking into changes of the cortex, I usually try to use surface-based methods uh, rather than BDM. Now, the issue here is that um, with the surface-based methods, you, you do not analyze subcortical structures. Um, that's a bit of a strength of BDM. Also, when you're looking into things like cerebellum, I mean, there are workarounds for that, um, but um, this is uh, probably something where VBM may be helpful if you suspect that the disease has um, effects that affect both the cortex and subcortical structures, like, I don't know, some um, movement disorders, dystonias, and so on. It may be helpful to use VBM. Um, but overall, I think it's a bit of an outdated method, and these newer approaches are, are better. So whenever I can, when I look at the cortex, I use uh, surface-based methods. Uh, when I look at subcortical structures, I use uh, some sort of volumetric methods um, or um, even uh, surface shape analysis. Even with subcortical structures, you can um, reconstruct them in 3D and then look at their surface shapes. That's what I was showing with the hippocampi, which will give you results that are on a sub-regional level. So that's the issue with volumes. You just get sort of one volume per structure, unless you segment them into subfields. Um, but you may be able to look at surface structure um, and then you get these sub-regional sub results. So in general, in most cases, I guess BBM is a bit outdated, to be honest. Uh, and the next question was, um, can this be used in clinic? Well, Yes and no. So usually um, um, comparing a single individual to a group of I don't know, controls is tricky um, regarding power and also, also tricky um, regarding some sort of statistical uh, approaches because the statistics are usually based on some linear models and are not, um, not optimal to compare one versus many cases. We use some non-parametric methods for that. So that's one issue. Now, the next issue is, um, what would you want to see? Um, now, these results that we were finding in, in, I don't know, temporal epilepsy or other forms of epilepsy are group-based results. Um, and they show these very widespread changes in you know, temporal epilepsy affecting both hemispheres. They're quite symmetrical. Um, and unless it's something more than hippocampal sclerosis, probably um, 
this will not be very helpful in saying, is this epilepsy or not? Where does the epilepsy come from? What is the lateralization of epilepsy? Now, having said that, there is there are not many approaches really transferring this into clinic. We've tried this once, and I again, I think um, probably using Presurfer here would be more helpful because there are huge data bases with, with normative values. Um, and so you can upload your free surfer output and you compare them to normative values from, I don't know, around 10,000 individuals and you get Z scores for every region in the brain, which is quite neat. And um, in, with using this approach, um, you may be able to transform the structure or the volumes um, of brain structure the patients into Z scores. And then you can say, well, which areas seem to be atrophic? Um, whether this is clinically helpful, nobody knows. Um, there's not much research regarding that. Uh, probably not very helpful, um, but it may generate nice pictures. Um, right. And using some, probably using some machine learning approaches may be a bit more helpful uh, regarding that. But really, the results were not very. Um, promising and um, transferring this sort of um, structural analysis into clinic on a single patient basis. Yeah, I think especially because if you would like to use uh, these techniques, probably SBM will be do better in tr trying to find biomarkers. I mean, because the idea would to identify, for example, a surgical candidate from the beginning. Maybe there are with some information in the neuroimaging that might help you, for example, know which patient might actually be benefit uh, or benefit from, from lesions. And you know, there is a concept about uh, like patient, a patient who is considered to be resistant based on the images. Of course, this is some, something tricky because it goes against uh, the usual conception of uh, considering a patient uh, uh, with a, resistant epilepsy when you have tried at least two uh, properly selected medications. But some people say that in some cases you should consider uh, certain lesions. Uh, uh, and it would be very nice if, for example, these techniques might help us to, 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 to try to find this population or trying to find a biomarker uh, for drug resistance or uh, even for, for cognitive decline, for example, or for some other uh, measurements. But, but of course, it's, it's something very difficult and I think it would need to huge uh, data sets. All right, so regarding surgical outcome, there, are, there is some evidence that atrophy of the thalamus um, is associated with worse surgical outcome, um, mainly because this represents a group of patients who have um, focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. And we know that those with focal to bilateral tonic clonic seizures have worse surgical outcomes. So again, um, probably you can extract that data very easily from, from clinic or from clinical reports already without really doing, having to do any um, uh, complicated um, uh, imaging analysis. And most of this data is really group level data whenever people are trying to look into surgical outcomes. and. Um, Right, so having, there's, there's no really excellent biomarker um, of, of surgical outcome like, um, with neuroimaging. I know that there are groups looking into, um, into using machine learning models, feeding in as much data as possible using imaging and EEG and other things and plus clinical data and trying to uh, optimize sort of outcome prediction. Um, but as far as I'm aware, nothing really um, uh, really promising or nothing that can be really translated straight into clinic has been generated so far. Marin, I know that you have done kind of pre versus post surgical anal in imaging analysis. Do you use SPM to register those images? Like the post surgical with the pre surgical and how do you kind of make sure that the registration is not affected by the resection. Yeah. That's a big issue. Do you do it manually? No, no, no. Um, well, um, I've, I've been using SPM and CAT12 to do that. Um, okay. And we've been using a lot of workarounds to, um, to work with post-surgical images. The issue is that um, when you have 
surgery, particularly if you have large surgery. In London, um, people are still doing um, anterior temporal lobectomies where you move to the anterior two thirds of the temporal lobe, which is a relatively large surgery. Then you get brain shift. Um, so mm -hmm. parts of the brain uh, sort of shift down and um, many of these pre-processing tools um, don't, work, uh, don't work optimally. Um, partly because um, also when SPMC is a hole in the brain, it tries to sort of fill it. Um, so you need to have some workarounds to do that. Uh, and also free surfer probably wouldn't work optimally uh, because some topological constraints wouldn't work because there's a hole in the brain. Um, so the workaround that I've been doing um, is if you have pre-surgical imaging, and I think this is a neat tri trick. We, we came up with it and it's described quite well in our papers. Um, so um, if you have a pre-surgical Im image of the patient, you just um, co-register the pre-surgical and post-surgical image. That works really well because the brains are extremely similar. So that works excellently. And then you just um, take the part of the brain that has been removed and place it on the post-surgical image. So you sort of mask the post-surgical image with a pre-surgical image. And um, suddenly your post-surgical brain looks almost so very similar to your pre-surgical mm -hmm. brain. You can do whatever pre-processing with it. Even pre-surgical would work then. So you just need to patch it with the um, area that has been removed, uh, providing you have a pre-surgical image. And then it suddenly works excellently. And you can use, I guess, I haven't tried, but probably you could use free surf and get really nice results. What you need to do after pre-processing is you need to mask out the, the parts of the brain mm -hmm. that you've been using for the patch. Okay, cool. And have you used, do you usually do that with the same um, uh, resolution, images with the same resolution? Or if you have a 3T and 1.5, would it work? Or do you, in your experience, I guess? <laughs> well, the good part of working at UCL was that most scans were done. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you had the same sequence in the same scanner, which was mm. used almost exclusively for, for, epilepsy, for epilepsy research. Um, but yes, yeah, so there are all sorts of issues when you compare data acquired on different mm. scanners using different sequences, of sequence parameters. And I guess this would, you would need to try. Uh, probably it, would, okay. it may work. Uh, you may have some issues with intensity, um, but there may be some small workarounds to do that. Um, I guess it, it, it may work reasonably well. Would you, would you recommend any database where, for example, the participants could try to download some images and then try the method? by themselves if um, because that's uh, for example that's something tricky if if you don't have access to, to a huge database to try to prove uh, or, or to experiment these methodologies well that's a good question now and um, there is a huge number of publicly available data sets um, and a lot of is available for um, healthy control data sets and there's a lot of publicly available data um, in people with dementia or Parkinson's disease or, um, uh, I don't know, uh, younger people with, with uh, some psychosis or things like that. I'm not sure, maybe somebody else knows about publicly available epilepsy data sets. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, probably there are not that many publicly available epilepsy data sets, to be honest. Um, and there is the um, Human Epilepsy Project or support something like that from the US. They've scanned um, a large number of people with new onset epilepsy. Um, and um, I'm not sure whether they made uh, data sets publicly available. Uh, I know that the group in Bonn um, made the data set of uh, more than 100 people, I guess, with focal cortical dysplasias publicly available. So there will be some small lesions in their brains, but this um, is an interesting data set to, to, to try um, and to look at. 
uh, particularly of also if you're looking into um, uh, possibilities to um, lesion detect and um, using some some approaches. Yeah. When you write papers or review papers, what's kind of the main things you look for, or do you, do you want, or that you need to address when working, when reading, or reviewing neuroimaging processing pipelines? Obviously, for example, the multiple comparisons to smoothing. Is there something else that we should have, you know, kind of keep an eye on? Right. I, I think the main thing is. Um statistics and uh, multiple comparisons um, and a lot of there's a huge amount of imaging research um, where there's no clean statistical approach and where um, there's some sort of p-value hunting um, or small volume corrections and things like that um, so i guess that's probably one of the most common uh, thing if, if, if people have a low power to um, detect abnormalities um, then they start to get a bit creative with statistical thresholds um, and either use uncorrected values or use some sort of um, weird corrections for I don't know, cluster sizes, or suddenly they start doing um, some weird small volume corrections just to uh, generate um, statistically significant results. Um, and I'm quite relaxed when it comes to these because I, I believe, um, well, um, obviously, if you don't have a huge amount of data, you have low power. So not always, particularly using BDM, uh, the effects may be so small, so they may be really difficult to detect using really stringent uh, statistical thresholds. But, but this needs to be reported very clearly and need to be very mm -hmm. clear that um, um, there is a risk of false positives in your data. So that's one thing. Um, and I guess the other thing is um, really looking at pre-processing in the presence of uh, I don't know, lesions or surgeries or things like that. Robert. Hi, uh, I just have a quick comment um, because yesterday I stumbled uh, over a big epilepsy data set that's publicly available in the Enigma toolbox. So there is like an Enigma toolbox that you can download for MATLAB and Python. And they, there is like a big uh, epilepsy data set available from the Whelan group. I don't know, they have some 1000 brains in case anyone is interested in that. It's not amazing. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Is that actually the data or is it, is it sort of just the, just the statistical results? Um, that I don't really know. I think <laughs> you can download I, so i don't know whether you really can get the images um but you can have access to the data uh, in order to compare it um in this enigma toolbox thingy uh yeah cool. enigma That's toolbox is a, is, a, is a great thing definitely do use that um and um what definitely will work is if you have some sort of your own results, you can compare them across many um, uh, disorders using the Enigma toolbox. I, so the times I've used SPM, one of the things that I kind of struggle with is selecting. So in SPM, you have to decide, for example, the smoothing parameters. And if you want to do a global calculation or global mean or, the cluster size and all that. And a couple of weeks ago at UCL, um, I kind of, we were discussing this and I noticed that in your video, you were showing that you use a cluster size of 20. Some people, I mean, and that's kind of, it depends on what you're looking for and obviously your the resolution of your images and all that. But some people, what they were saying is that sometimes what you should do is that you use, type that, you, the cluster that you should use is just zero. And once you get the results that are completely kind of co corrected for multiple comparisons, obtain the, or look for the smallest cluster. And once you know that smallest cluster, use that cluster and rerun it again. Like the one you had, the, the, the one of the results, you set to create the new kind of rerun a new analysis using that smaller cluster. So that's kind of, kind of a tip that they gave. 
also this smoothing the when you select the smoothing uh, so i think in in spm the default one is eight if i'm correct um, but this number depends on the resolution of your images. So the one that you should use is double or three times the size of your voxel. So just for you to have in mind. So if it's a two times two times two, then it should be, it's usually like you could use a three um, F full, full width half max <laughs> value or yeah, or eight, this also works. And if you're doing, I think longitudinal analysis or if you have, Again, another tip: um, a lot of pathology in your wide matter. The recommendation is to use a higher uh, full width max, a half max, so the patho like the pathological area or the pathological voxel is included in the wide matter. Is not affects the gray matter in case pathology is in the wide matter. So again, another tip. Um, and the other tip was doing so there is an option in SPM that is the global mean calculation something like that when you're doing like a normal like a script like a normal analysis and you can either add the intracranial volume as a covariate or you can use it as the global mean like to use it to the global mean calculation and kind of they recommend to use it as a global mean calculation variable just to input that value there instead of having it as a covariate so just some couple of tips. <laughs> All right. So, thank you, Karina. Those are a couple of uh, more advanced. Um, <laughs> and um, now the issue with SPM is that um, that it's optimized for primarily for fMRI analysis. So, and that's also mm -hmm. the strength of SPM. It's really good with fMRI, and and VBM is a bit of a sidekick of SPM, I would say. Uh, so many of those things and um, and the settings are rather optimized for fMRI. Um, and regarding what was it, regarding cluster correction, yeah. there's a lot of discussion regarding that. And um, there's not really a right or wrong uh, what you can do. And what people frequently do is um, um, that, at least for fMRI or for functional imaging, you can also do that for PET. Uh, but that's not really great for, for VBM. But what, what they, they do is that, um, First, you um, look at your uncorrected results, um, and then you sort of choose um, based yeah. on a certain threshold, like uh, p below 0 0.001. Uh, you choose uh, the um, smallest class. You choose that as, as a cutoff, and then um, you um, you look at the corrected cluster-wise corrected results, and then um, use the smallest significant cluster. Um, as a cutoff. And as far as I'm aware, for statistical results, uh, reasons, um, this works well for fMRI, but probably not so well for VBM. Also, the, the effect sizes are much smaller in VBM. If you're looking mm -hmm. into really uh, super small effects, um, um, and fMRI usually shows much larger effect sizes. Um, and there's also a different suggestion within the CAT12 toolbox where you can either use a uh, some sort of a threshold free correction that's implemented in the toolbox as well, which may be interesting. And, or you can um, sort of empirically um, arrive at a suggested minimal cluster size. I'm not sure how the statistic exactly <laughs> works, but there, there is, it's, descri it's described in the CAT12 manual as well. Um, and for demonstration purposes, I just use something like 20. Um, just to get rid of the really yeah. um, uh, ones, yeah. worst noise in the images. And smoothing is another issue like that. Um, so there's not really a right or wrong. I mean, there are some rough mm -hmm. recommendations. I would use whatever is being used in literature um, for similar scans and similar resolutions. But this may influence your results. Um, using more or less smoothing may actually, you may arrive at different yeah. Results, to be honest, which yeah. then is tricky to interpret, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have more questions, concerns, problems running SPM? Yeah, I would just be interested. Whoever used SPM in the past, you can raise your hands. 
Now, Kingdoms. Somebody. Yes, there you go. A couple of people. All right. Yeah. And whoever was using Free Surfer. Yeah, two people. There you go. Anybody Thanks. doing any lesion detection? There are a couple of approaches for that. So surface-based approaches like the Melt project or some uh, voxel-based approaches like the Map Toolbox. Yeah, a few people mm -hmm. are nodding. Yeah, yeah I think next week. week. Yeah, next yeah. week we're going to talk uh, with Conrad about uh, uh, focal cortical dysplasia detection using the Melt. Yeah, pipeline. there you go. This is something you can do on an N equals one basis. So that's really much more helpful than I was I was showing you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Conrad is a great guy and um, um, it's, they've, they've done a tremendous uh, amount of work on this and um, it's really, really um, helpful, I would say. Yes, the, the idea of, of um, inviting you and of course even is like trying to, to show to the participants different tools so they can decide what's most useful for them. Uh, whenever they are going to work on their projects and from next session on probably we're going to work on a more uh, clinically oriented or patient oriented uh, approaches for lesion detection also spect analysis and also uh, quantitative pet excellent no so vbm sbm are clearly at methods used for research purposes yeah. um, and they've been i would say almost overused in the past but if you have a good clinical question you can really uh, approach a very interesting, uh, very interesting things using these methods. So one of my scientific interests is into epilepsy um, and neurodegeneration. And um, obviously brain MRI is an excellent marker of neurodegeneration and using these structural methods to analyze brains in people with epilepsy is a great opportunity to use imaging as a biomarker of neurodegeneration epilepsy. So that's one of our research focuses. And um, although this is not something you will do on an N equals one basis, you can still generate interesting research results and really exciting insights um, out of these, these things that then may be translated the next step into, into clinic. Yes. No more questions. Yeah, I think we can call it a day. Yeah, hopefully you managed to download SPM and open it. It's, I think, one of the things. Oh, yeah, I have actually one question. Have you used SPM using the MATLAB standalone um, thing, mm -hmm. you know, like without MATLAB, basically? <laughs> oh, I, never, I never used it because um, uh, our university. Yeah, you always have MATLAB, yeah. <laughs> There is a standalone standalone version. That's also there's also a standalone version for Cat twelve. Um, okay. And also, um, there are you, you can also use terminal or Unix commands to operate Cat twelve, um, which um, which um, is very helpful if you want to deal with large data sets or if you want to standardize your your analysis. Okay. So Juan, you're asking if any comments on the con toolbox. Ryan, have you used con the con toolbox? Um, just a tiny bit. I mean, um, connectivity is not, not a huge strength of mine, and um, that's obviously a completely different topic. Um, but the con toolbox is very straightforward to use, I would say. So if you have um, if you have resting state fMRI data, then the con toolbox is uh, one of the more easier to use toolboxes um, to analyze that data. And um, yeah, definitely give it a try. And it has great documentation as well. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's really good. I use it a lot. Um, it's when you're working with a lot of data, it can be a little bit slow. Um, and it has, so it's basically the con toolbox is this GUI that uses different softwares, SPM, AFNI, et cetera, et cetera, to process fMRI data. And everything is kind of, in a stepwise manner. So you just start upload your data, pre-process it, you get the results, then you follow, and it kind of opens next steps. 
The problem with that, or in my opinion, is that there's so many options, like so many options that you have. And if you're not an expert in fMRI, it's just a mess because you have to decide literally every single kind of thing that you need to, that you want to do. You need to like type it in and say, this is the number that I want to use and, you know, do more motion correction or less or et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's really good if you know what you're doing, basically. So if you have a fMRI, I will, I think there, I think, I don't know if it's con or there's another one in fMRI prep. And I think it's a little bit easier for the pre-processing or more straightforward than, than con. With con, you do everything from literally from DICOM to statistics, literally the, you know, BCA or IC or whatever you're, you want to do or graph theory analysis, so, which is cool. But, but yeah, it's, you need to kind of, do a lot of reading <laughs> to be able to use it. <laughs> yeah, completely agree, Karina. And that's that's the big issue with many of these neuroimaging things that um, if you, I mean, they have a very steep learning curve. So yeah. uh, if you confront it with them for the first time, it can be very daunting. And the easiest thing to do is really to find a person that has used the toolbox, uh, whatever <laughs> toolbox it is once, and then just see whatever they're doing and then try to replicate it. Um, and um, that may make it a bit easier. Yeah. yeah. All right, there's this micro toolbox. I have never used that one. Yeah. No, no, me neither. It's from at, uh, yeah, at front day from M and I are also having different approaches uh, to do connectivity analysis. If someone is interested, I just shared it. And uh, but of course, I don't know how to. I haven't used them because it's not uh, yeah what I'm working on right now. Interesting. Okay. Cool. I yeah, I guess one, one additional yeah. comment I would say is um, when you're doing like a, kind of a tip is when you're working with neuroimaging, try before reporting anything or kind of concluding anything, you should look for stuff that you know that you're going to find in your images. So for example, if you're doing a connectivity analysis, you expect that age for age to have an effect. If you're not seeing an effect of age, then there's probably something wrong with your data or with your pipeline. And same with, if you're looking for uh, doing a group analysis and you don't see any difference at all anywhere, it's maybe there's, it's because there's no difference at all, but also it's more likely that if you're expecting something and you know there's a difference, then you should see something. And it's probably, if there is, if you're not seeing anything, there's an error with your script or with your images. So as always, just rule number one is just always, always look at the images, both the input and the output and make sure they're fine. They're not like upside down because that's usually, that's a common error. <laughs> and it's just like the image is completely upside down and that's the registration is wrong. We'll so always look right. at the input. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's it. Yeah, no. <laughs> so always look at your image, always have a copy of your raw image and always check if, you know, the output is what you're expecting and if the analysis is, somehow following your hypothesis you know at any level because if it's not it's just maybe there's an error with your script or your image and it's you should correct for that and again try not to make softwares so that's most softwares as we were telling you in a couple of weeks ago i i, I go some of these softwares use different um for a um, orientations, like some of them use the neurological orientation, some of them use the biological orientation when they're like transforming the images. And they usually kind of have work around these issues, but if you reorient your image outside of the software and then you wanna use it in another software, then it can be a mess. So try to stick with one software and try to select the software that will, will give you the answers to your question. So if you want to group analysis, obviously with the surface, you can use it free surfer or SPM or FSL. Um, but if you only want to just like thickness measures, you can just use free surfer or the CAD 12 and don't just like move them around softwares because it's just messy. So yeah, just those two last comments. <laughs> and, and one more thing that I, I learned is that it's it's very helpful if you have your statistical results to really look under the surface. Uh, don't just look at the peaks um, that um, arise after thresholding, but look whatever lies under the surface. Um, I'm not saying that you should you have to, you should report uncorrected or 
uh, some dodgy results. I'm just saying you need to understand whatever uh, is happening under the surface um, and um, just to explore your data and try to understand um, which areas of the brain may be generating um, some almost significant results or, or what, whatever is happening under the surface, uh, which may give you a lot of insights about if there are some pre-processing errors or errors in your statistics. Um, and also to explain whatever you're seeing um, using your thresholded data. Yeah. Great, so I think that's all. Thank you so much, Marion, for the video and your time. It's always really helpful and really good. And um, hope everyone has a now a better idea of how on how to use SPM and that you start using it more often. And yeah, looking forward to the next session and see you again next week. Thank yeah, you, and also just uh, in Andy's brain's book, there is also a good uh, tutorial about uh, using uh, SPM if, if there are some remaining questions. Also, you can find there a good tutorial. But uh, of course, it's more oriented to uh, fMRI, but, uh, but I think it, uh, there might be a few things useful as well as in the SPM web page. Yeah. Oh, and also SPM, I think you can do EEG pre-processing, right, in SPM. So I've never done that. I've never, so I don't know. Marion, have you used the EEG? No. Oh, sure. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what is it for. <laughs> and can do uh, also EEG, MEG pre-processing. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's a very strong software. And probably VBM is not the strongest side of it. Um, mm -hmm. And there are probably newer methods uh, that you can use, um, like what I was showing, like these surface-based vertical methods. Uh, but for fMRI um, and uh, even for you know EEG preprocessing, it's still very, uh, very good. Okay. PET also a lot of PET can be done using. Yes. Great. Well, thank you very much, Marian. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay.